All right, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm here to ask an important question about potentially the lower drug tolerance that could be in existence for people who are vaccinated. Now, this is not specifically just related to drug overdoses, which is what I'm focused on this evening, but it's a general question as to whether or not the general population has a lower tolerance to specific toxic kinds of drugs. It's an important question because if it is relevant, we should be advising people to be very cautious. Generally, you don't want people to be using anything that is toxic, but even if they are, you want them to recognize the limitations of safety. Now, why am I even thinking of this? Well, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to any adjustment in the way how health is operating, the first question in my mind is always, could it be related to the elephant in the room? Now, some people may say, no, you need to have evidence that the elephant is the problem. I go completely the opposite way. I say, no, if something has changed, you need to prove to me that it is not the elephant that is part of the problem. That's my approach. You can agree or disagree with it, but it is what I believe would be the safe way to make sure that we are not missing relevant things coming out of the pandemic. So before I start, I'll just like to remind you, if you had missed this presentation below, I'd like you to take a click on the link and try and see if you can view it at the discounted rates for the course. That's for those people who are interested. But getting back to the point here, lower drug tolerance in the vaccinated. What really am I talking about? I'm focused on Vancouver, Canada. And this was because of a very interesting bit of work that was done. So in this paper here, we have that British Columbia, they were trialing drug decriminalization. The paper was published in February, 2020, um, February 2023. And they were highlighting that British Columbia is taking on the huge step of decriminalizing the possession of small quantities, not all quantities, of illicit drugs, including cocaine, methamphetamine, ecstasy, and opioids like heroin, fentanyl, and morphine. So this is the baseline that I'm coming from. And in truth, it was largely because of a comment that somebody made about when they had seen Vancouver recently and they saw the amount of um, people who use drugs on the streets, this was relevant, that it caused me to think about it and go and look in a little bit more detail as to whether or not this could possibly be relevant to what was happening in relation to drug deaths. So I'll highlight here another important piece of the puzzle. And this is looking at the um, unregulated drug poisoning emergency dashboard in British Columbia. So this information is all freely available and the link is below for anybody who wants to peruse it. And what I was looking at here was the paramedic attended opioid overdose event indicators. So they were looking at people who had overdose events attended by paramedics um, on a monthly rate. And you can see here that this is going all the way from 2015. And you can see here a steady rise and then it plateaus here. I know um, this is now, I think, a little bit of time in the period where they were doing the um, decriminalization. So there is a stable period here. But beyond this point here, this is just beyond 2020 going into 2021, you see a significant rise up here, which has then been sustained over time. So the question would be, why would we see this kind of sustained pattern? with regards to drug overdoses and paramedics and deaths. And this is the link that I think is relevant in terms of a paper that was published recently. And this paper was looking at sex-specific differences in myocardial injury incidents after 
the COVID-19 mRNA boost of vaccinations. And they were looking at males and females, and they, they found quite interestingly that the incidence of myocardial injury up to 30 days after the vaccine was higher in women than it was in men. This is uh, different from what we used to see where younger males were the ones who had the most significant events. So that in itself was a very interesting finding in the paper. But the more important issue was to do with the frequency of this occurring. And the frequency in the context of the paper was almost 2.8% when they looked at the the discussion in the paper, I'll highlight it here so that you can see it. And so in the discussion in the paper, they found that they confirmed that the booster vaccination was associated with elevation of markers of myocardial injury occurring in one out of 35 persons, 2.8%. This is significantly greater than what had been estimated at 0.0035%. And this is what is tend to be quoted when they say that actually the vaccine is extremely safe and effective. And if you mention myocarditis, they will be referring to that 0.0035% rate that they noted for myocarditis. Remember, this study in terms of troponin levels was finding a 2.8%. That is a very significant difference. One in 35 people could have some degree of myocarditis. This is where it gets really interesting in the context of this group of people in Vancouver, Canada. Why would I select this? Well, they did a very interesting thing in this area, and it was really a good public health strategy at the time. They were targeting drug users in Vancouver for vaccination. And their, I guess their view was that if they vaccinated the uh, cohort, they would reduce the spread of disease and therefore get out of the pandemic earlier. Additionally, they would protect them from severe disease. That was the theory. I guess they didn't realize that the vaccine doesn't in the long term protect against infection and it does have an impact on the severity of disease. So what they were doing as a whole was actually quite good. It's just that it may have had some unintended consequences when they looked at the outcomes in the longer term. And when I go back to this article here, I found it very interesting. By the end of March, 91% of people in older in the local health area, including the downtown east side, that's the area that has the uh, high uh, uptake, they had uh, two doses of the vaccine that the study had found. And this was the situation for this, this region. That's very important. So they managed to achieve a significant vaccination rate, even in those who were on the street and who were using drugs. As I said, that was a good public health strategy. But in the context of the unanticipated outcomes, then that could be quite a concern. Here we have the um, British Columbia government news highlighting the unregulated drug supply chains claims 184 British Columbians in June of 2023. So this is just in one month that they had 184 people die. This was quite significant, and it's really catching the attention of the um, public health um, regions. They, they have found that fentanyl seems to be the major um, driver of unregulated drug deaths. And so it could be something related to fentanyl use. It could be that the drug has become um, adulterated. But whichever way you take it, my question is, has that cohort now got a lower tolerance for being exposed to some of these drugs. In the past, their heart could have taken the overdose. Maybe they wouldn't have ended up with arrhythmias, abnormal rhythms of the heart. This is again, not known for certain, but if you have done an autopsy on these patients and you haven't found a clear cause of death, it's either going to be because of the damage to um, the respiratory center where they stop breathing with an opioid, or potentially because the drugs are being mixed, you can have a myocarditis 
kind of picture where they got a terminate a, an, an arrhythmia that led to death. This is an important point because I think it is relevant across the broad population. If one in 35 are having evidence of even mild myocarditis, they should be cautious with regards to their exposure to stresses on the heart. How long? I don't know. But until there is adequate research, until the scientific community has done its job of making sure that people are not at higher risk, especially in an environment where we are seeing higher rates of excess deaths in highly vaccinated regions. It raises the point that there is far more work to be done to make sure that everyone is safe. This is the situation we have now. The responsibility is not to prove that there is a problem. The responsibility on regulators is to prove that their actions over the past two years has actually been safe for the public. Have a good evening.